Yeah, so it's a, a great pleasure to have Professor Igor Klevana from Princeton University. And uh, uh, we are very happy to have you in our QASTM seminar series. And uh, this is our 16th mm -hmm. seminar series uh, where uh, Igor is going to speak about breaking of discrete and continuous symmetries mm -hmm. in Sajdev E. Kichayev like models. Hopefully, mm -hmm. you are talking about the tensor models or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah bo both random and non random models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Santan. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I noticed, I looked at your schedule and it seems like you're about to go back to in-person seminars, right? Uh, uh, yeah. The tail end of uh, the Zoom era, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it has the advantages that people from far away can join, so. Yeah, yeah, that's the main motivation. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that you see the title and uh, Actually, it's the first seminar I'm giving on, on some new work that I've been doing for an unbelievably long amount of time, something like a year and a half running project. Uh, and then finally, this paper was uh, appeared uh, in the latest mailing uh, with uh, Alexei Milokhin, uh, Grisha Tarnaposki, and uh, Wang Li Zhao. This was really like a long running project. I'll talk about it at the end. This is actually continuous symmetry breaking in coupled complex SYK models. And uh, a big surprise to us was that uh, on, fri uh, on Friday, we saw uh, a closely related paper by a group from UBC by Sahu, Marcel Franz, and uh, two other collaborators. Um, yeah, you'll see the reference later. So it's exciting. There is some activity on this. Uh, uh, but before I get to that, uh, yeah, I should say that uh, this was somewhat inspired by this paper with uh, J1 Kim, uh, Tarnapolsky and Zhao, which appeared uh, uh, yeah, over a year ago on discrete symmetry breaking and coupled Majorana SYK models or tensor models. So these two papers are like the the news kind of, but uh, but before then, I want to uh, talk more generally about these type of uh, melonic models, and these are additional references. In particular, there is a review I wrote with uh, <coughs> uh, Fyodor Popov and Tarnapolsky on uh, uh, based on Tessie lectures they gave, uh, so you can. Uh, this, uh, I hope, covers the basics. Okay, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Uh, uh, so, so this is a kind of customary first slide in these kinds of talks, uh, that uh, we basically have three types of large end limits. Uh, two of them are very well known, and the third one is gradually becoming better known. So the ON vector model uh, that goes back to the 50s, 60s, perhaps um, uh, the Berlin Katz uh, spherical model is of this type. And then uh, uh, I guess Stanley was the first one to show that ON vector model is exactly solvable in the large end limit. Even the great uh, Ken Wilson uh, was one of the pioneers of this. So these models are solvable in uh, any number of dimensions and their solvability has to do with the fact that they're dominated by these tree-like chains of bubbles, which are sometimes called the cactus, uh, cactus Feynman diagrams. And they can be summed with the help of an uh, auxiliary field trick. Now a somewhat newer uh, a newer limit which goes back to the 70s is the famous 12th limit, which is so important for QCD. Uh, and that sprouted a, a whole activity on solvable uh, non-Gaussian large end matrix models, uh, which is still going on. In that case, we of course have uh, dominance by planar diagrams. Uh, that is not solvable uh, generally. If it were, we would have solved large NQCD, but that's still not solvable. Uh, but uh, 
some special models like C equal one matrix models, C less than one, say one matrix models, matrix chain models, and that sort of thing. And then perhaps the big surprise is the solvability of the planar limit of the n equal four super Young mills, which is dual to ADS five crosses five. But we certainly understand this matrix large n limit still a lot less than the vector limit. And then finally, the tensor large n limit. <coughs> in general, uh, many people felt that this would be uh, hard to solve because as you go from vectors to matrices, it gets much harder. But surprisingly, there are specially chosen tensor models uh, which are exactly solvable, and in some ways, their solvability is closer to that of the vector models because. They're again dominated by a small subset of planar diagrams called melonic diagrams. And here I'm showing the, <coughs> the picture of melonic diagrams in uh, quartic theory. They're essentially obtained by iteration of insertion of sunset graphs into propagators. And these are the first few vacuum melonic diagrams. The term melonic was, uh, was invented in this very nice paper by Bonzom Gouraud. Uh, Riello and Rivasso uh, back in 2011. By then, the activity was already going on. Uh, and uh, and uh, I got excited about it when I saw Witten's paper in, uh, uh, on Halloween day of 2016 uh, and started working on it with Grisha Tarnapolsky. So, so just to give you an idea of how the simplest uh, Melonic models come about. Let me go back to a matrix model first. And let me talk about a somewhat unconventional matrix model where instead of a Hermitian matrix, so the historically the matrix models go back to the idea of uh, Eugene Wigner, who basically wanted to approximate the spectrum, energy spectrum of very large nuclei by eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix of a, with a Gaussian distribution. Uh, so for that reason, one often talks about Hermitian matrices. But suppose we instead talk about just general real matrices, phi AB, uh, with no symmetry condition uh, imposed. So we have distinguishable, distinguishable indices. And uh, uh, we impose ON symmetry acting on the first index and another ON symmetry acting on the second index. Then the interaction is at least quartic. The simplest interaction that we can have is single trace, trace phi phi transpose phi phi transpose with some coefficient g. Uh, and another interaction which you can include is a double trace one. Uh, I will not immediately include it because uh, that one leads essentially to a vectorial large n limit. So, uh, so in propagators, so the structure of this vertex, if I denote first index by red and second index by green, it looks like this. And propagator is just a double line, a red, green color double line uh, using this Hoff double line notation. And then this model actually is uh, also exactly solvable uh, for d equal zero or d equal one, but it's not in general exactly solvable. Uh, if you, if you look at the dominant diagrams in the large end limit where Gn is held fixed, uh, we find uh, planar, planar Feynman graphs uh, where you have alternating red and green loops. So here is the structure of, uh, so each vertex here is the one I draw has the structure. And you see that you need to have an alternation of red and green loops. And the dual graph is just a bunch of squares glued together in a special way. Um, so you get this planar graph, and this is a kind of uh, random surface uh, made of, of squares. Okay, so, so this is pretty old stuff. <laughs> but now let's, uh, let's enrich this model somewhat by adding a third index. Uh, so instead of uh, ON cross ON, we will have ON cubed. Uh, so the idea is to take uh, <coughs> a degree of freedom with three indices now, phi A, B, C, uh, and then the index structure of the propagator will be 
uh, product of three delta functions. And then it's uh, again, <coughs> can be represented. So each propagator of this phi field can be represented by uh, three strands uh, of three, three separate colors. Uh, <clears throat> so, so far it's just a plausible extension, but now a lot depends on how you choose this uh, quartic interaction. And in fact, there is a special choice which is called the tetrahedral vertex uh, which, unlike the previous one, doesn't look planar. I mean, this matrix model vertex, uh, of course, looks planar, right? But then we want to add the third line, and we have some choice how to do it. We can do it, for example, uh, in a way that it still stays planar, but that's not the one that we want. We want uh, these middle blue lines going under each other. And then you can uh, imagine this as a view of a tetrahedron. Uh, so, so an interesting thing <coughs> is that when you, when you look at every pair of fields, they have only a single index contraction in common. Right? For example, these two fields have only uh, A1 index contracted, so one red line. This, uh, for example, this, these two fields have a blue line in common and so on. Uh, okay, and uh, yeah, I'll show why it's tetrahedral in a second, even more explicitly. Uh, but then if you just play with this vertex and just start, essentially every index loop brings you a factor of n, right? And then you want to study what are the leading corrections in the large n limit. Uh, for example, what is the leading propagator correction? Uh, you see that <laughs> that uh, the maximal number of additional loops uh, compared to the tree level graph is actually three. So this is what people call the Mellon uh, insertion, uh, used to be called sunset graph, or still called sunset graph. But, uh, but you see that uh, the way it's connected is it's certainly non-planar, and you have this blue, blue strand going under here in both places. There is a, a blue, uh, blue uh, contracted index here. There is a green contracted index here and the red one here. So this graph is of order G squared because there are two Gs and then there is N cubed. And uh, so obviously to make, uh, to make this diagram not diverge compared to the tree diagram, you want to keep G squared N cubed fixed. Uh, in the large n limit. And that's something rather different from what we saw in that Hoft case or in the vector case, because there we had gn. Uh, <clears throat> so so the, this is uh, basically uh, the proposal then that this theory makes sense in the large n limit keeping lambda, which is gn to the three halves fixed. And then when you start counting further graphs, you see that all of them actually stay finite in this order. It's uh, very easy to prove in this particular case because it, it, you can take turns erasing, for example, all blue, blue strands and then you're back to just the matrix model graph. You can erase all red strands and you're base, uh, back to another matrix model graph and so on. Uh, just a double line fat graph. So one can prove that uh, all the dominant graphs in this large n limit are obtained by <coughs> Uh, by iterating insertion of the propagator. Namely, you take every propagator and then you insert this, uh, this melon here. And if you go back to my original picture, you see that all of them are indeed obtained by this type of iteration. Like you can insert, for example, if you take this propagator and insert the melon here, you obtain this graph and then you can keep inserting them and actually, uh, you obtain some tree, also tree-like structures where these, uh, uh, these insertions just sort of proliferate and become new. Okay, so this is the structure of these. So, so here are some examples. Uh, so in terms of cables, they, these are black cables and inside each cable there are these, uh, these three, three colored wires. <coughs> Uh, you see that uh, just by playing with it, 
we see that the large end limit is never violated. For example, both in this limit I outlined, both of these graphs are of order n cubed, which is the right scaling because every single leading graph is of order n cubed because there are n cubed degrees of freedom. Uh, on the other hand, the non melonic graphs uh, are subleading. For example, the simplest non melonic graph with an odd number of vertices is this, this type of graph. And you can see that the big, uh, this is suppressed by n to the three halves compared to the equal scaling. In fact, it's not hard to see that none of the graphs with an odd number of vertices can be melonic because in this scaling, they always, in, acquire fractional power of n and that cannot cannot work. Um, so here here is a <clears throat> uh, from the book by Kleinert and Schulte Frohlinde. Uh, you they gave like some list of vacuum diagrams for 5-4 theory, not large n but just general 5-4 theory. And uh, it's amusing to look what subset of them are uh, melonic, and actually only four are melonic here. This one, then this one, and then these two. So the not, and the rest are all uh, some. Uh, so this uh, clever large end limit <coughs> filters out a very small subset of graphs. Basically, yeah. Here we omitted the tadpole graphs or these bubble graphs. So those are additional ones in those are also non-melonic. So out of these tadpole-free graphs, only four out of 27 are melonic. Uh, it was shown in this paper by Gonzalo Metal that the number of melonic graphs with p vertices grows like c to the p. So, so the perturbation theory is summable and, uh, uh, and one can uh, find some interesting large end behaviors in this type of theories. Okay, I could uh, talk more uh, along these lines, but uh, I want to actually now switch gears to fermionic models. I mean, so far what I said is equally applicable to just say, for example, 5-4 theory and 4 minus epsilon dimensions. We indeed wrote papers like this, but somehow the true, uh, the truly healthy models of this type so far have been found in quantum mechanics of many Majorana fermions or many Dirac fermions with sensor indices or other type of structure. And these models are definitely of interest to condensed matter uh, physicists. So I hope that some of my uh, talk will be accessible to people working on condensed matter physics. Uh, okay, so, so here is, uh, a list of condensed matter physicists, such as Yekitaev, uh, and they came up with this idea, which actually has become very popular in our high energy formal theory uh, circles. <coughs> uh, so they, uh, this is actually the model which uh, here I'm showing the so-called Majorana SYK model, which was first written down by Kitaev in a series of talks in 2015, I believe. And this has been a pretty dominant, uh, uh, dominant direction in both uh, high energy and condensed matter fields since then. So you take a bunch of, uh, say, a large number of Majorana fermions, a, here I denote them by N, S, Y, K, and they're just uh, the psi i degrees of freedom <laughs> so you have the anti-commutation relation psi i anti-commutator of psi j is equal to delta i j. So you can represent them by just Euclidean gamma matrices in, uh, in n dimensions. And uh, this just comes from this, uh, this action. Uh, but the, the crucial trick is to make the, the coupling constant, uh, coupling them q at a time, uh, to be random and have a Gaussian distribution with a mean that's scaled appropriately as n goes to infinity. So how this i to the power q by 2 factor came? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's needed to make uh, the interaction Hermitian. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, right, right. Yeah, without, without it, uh, yeah, so for the same actually happens in tensor models. Yeah, 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 yeah. true. Uh, that if you take psi to the six to make it Hermitian, yeah. you, you need the factor of n, right? True. Uh, okay, but I, I'll mainly be talking about q equal four, yeah. just to make life simpler. Uh, q, uh, the quartic fermion models, there are probably more paper is written on quartic fermion models and on anything else in physics. <laughs> so, so it's a well well trodden terrain, you know, the Hubbard model, all sorts of spin chains. So we are trying to add something to a very well developed field and uh, let's see if we succeed. Uh, well, certainly uh, they succeeded. <laughs> uh, so, so why? So, what? What is special about these models? Uh, if you start doing just a Feynman graph expansion of these models, where you first do this, uh, you know, say two quartic vertices, and then you have to average over pairs of j's, which is denoted. This average is denoted by dotted line. Amazingly, you discover that only these uh, Milani graphs uh, contribute again. You just have to make these. Melonic moves, inserting in each propagator this vertex and subsequent averaging. So even though they didn't use this language, these were melonic theories. And, uh, and we'll see in a second that these uh, uh, models have very fascinating structure of their energy spectrum, which makes them possibly good models for black holes. In particular, there is a <coughs> big industry about uh, studying the correspondence between two-dimensional black holes in the early anti-decider space and these, uh, uh, these SYK type models. That part I will not talk so much about, but I'll mention some related stuff at the end. But let's just uh, do something very basic. Uh, oops. Yeah, if we do something very basic, yeah, let's look at the spectrum of the, uh, this SYK model take n equal 32 Majorana fermions. Uh, this, uh, every pair of Majorana fermions is a single qubit. So you have 16 qubits, which have two to the 16 energy levels, which is already a huge number of energy levels. But this can actually be fully diagonalized on a computer, and then you can do repeated sampling to average various quantities. That's the idea. You basically, you don't, uh, in the large end limit, you, you need uh, fewer and fewer samples, but at this level of n, sometimes you can do averaging over many samples. But let's just look at a single sample. Then you get this type of smooth distribution. So near the center of the distribution, zero energy, you see this uh, nearly Gaussian distribution. Okay, this is the Gaussian, but then it, we're mostly interested in the low energy dynamics, which is near the edge here. And here it differs a lot from Gaussian, uh, and a lot of uh, ink has been spilled studying the dynam this dynamics of the uh, energy level. So obviously, since we have two to the n over two energy levels, the density of states is going to be huge and grow exponentially here in the center. That's obvious. But what's less obvious is that for this particular model, it still stays exponentially large, even near the edges. So if you look at, for example, zooming in on this region near the edge, you still see that the energy levels are dense. You see coefficients that they're dense. By the way, I have to thank uh, my collaborator, Grisha Tarnapolsky, for giving me this slide. He's a big master of these sorts of presentations. Uh, okay, and uh, then we zoom in some more, and you basically see that uh, it still stays stays pretty large here, uh, and the density of states is exponentially um, still exponentially large even here, and this is why the low temperature entropy stays non-zero in this model. I mean, strictly at zero temperature, the ground state is non-degenerate. Even in this region, you still get like a finite 
zero temperature uh, per, per site. This is entropy divided by. Okay, so, so this is this, uh, this uh, random SYK model and it exhibits very physically interesting behavior. Namely, it's uh, the, probably the closest thing you can get to, to conformal quantum mechanics. It's uh, basically taking this model in the large end limit. Of course, at any finite end, it's not strictly conformal because there's still a finite dimensional Hilbert space. But... Uh, one, one question. So can you please comment on how uh, uh, this thing like zero temperature entropy is computed from this? Uh, well, <clears throat> so you can basically just uh, study the density of states, okay. uh, basically in some, some region here, mm -hmm. uh, and just see what is the multiplying factor. Uh, okay. For the, for the that. I mean, the, there is an overall factor which is e to the s, e to the little s naught times uh, n. The number of eigenvalues. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, there is this. Uh, this factor multiplies a universal function, which is the square root of the sinh. Okay. okay. Which has been explored a lot, and uh, for example, the the paper by Saad, uh, Schenker, and Stanford. Mm -hmm. You know this uh, this square root of sinh. That's uh, uh, a kind of universal factor in this double scaling limit. So, so if you are very precise about what's going on here, it's okay. really the s not n times square root of sinh of of the energy. Okay. Uh, and they devised some double scaled matrix model where you can see this. One thing that. Uh, you definitely see even with the naked eye is that it goes like square root of E minus E naught, very close to here. Mm -hmm. uh, the cinch is apparently universal. And there was a paper by uh, Gurari, Mahajan, and Vaezi where they numerically even established the square root of cinch pretty, pretty well. I see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, so now let me switch to tensor models, which uh, at finite end, their spectra look very, very different from, from these in particular. Because of the continuous symmetry groups, they have huge degeneracies, which grow as powers of n. Uh, but from the point of view of diagrammatics, they're actually very similar to, to these random SYK models. So you have you take uh, Majorana fermions. So the first model of this type was uh, written down by Witt and based on Gurari's construction a few years ago. Uh, and then with Tarnopolsky, we simplified it a bit. And this may be the minimal sort of SYK-like tensor model in uh, in quantum in fermionic quantum mechanics. So the basic anti-commutation relations of these three index Majoranas are like this. There is a product of delta functions. And we take this tetrahedral vertex, uh, which I already exhibited, and some shift is added so that the spectrum is exactly symmetric around E equals zero. Uh, yeah, I should say that while this spectrum looks on the average symmetric, there are no exact symmetries here because J's are totally randomly selected. Uh, and in particular, but here you will actually find a large number of exactly equal zero states. And for every energy E, there is a corresponding state with energy minus E. So here, the coupling G is a uh, random coupling or? Uh, no, no, it's not random. a random. <clears throat> it's, just an, uh, it's just a number. Okay, okay. We will be scaling G uh, to zero uh, in the large end limit as uh, lambda n to the minus. Okay. Yeah. So that, yeah, we do like this uh, scaling that I described above. It's a completely non random model. Mm -hmm. But it so appears to it's basically matching with the Witten's paper, I think. Witten commented, uh, right, right. 
Yeah, yeah, he had a model with four, uh, four species of this size. Yeah. Uh, that model has ON to the six symmetry. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, the, so he had four N cube species. Uh, but the idea is very similar. I, basically, this model is, I think, the closest to, uh, to just a single Majorana SYK model. Well, Witten's model turns out to be close to one of these Gross-Rosenhaus generalized SYK model, flavored SYK. You basically mm -hmm. had like four flavors and... Uh... <laughs> but yeah, the idea is, uh, is very similar. Uh, so, so then you have uh, just one tensor like this. There is ON cross ON cross ON symmetry. And then there are correspondingly three, uh, three SON symmetry charges uh, for the first SON, the second SON, and the third SON. Uh, one uh, amusing thing about this model, uh, so, so, so let me first just show how you can draw this uh, vertex. I already drew this. You can draw it like this, or you can just merge these two points then you can clearly see that there is a tetrahedron here. So a view of the tetrahedron from the side. And these blue, blue edges cross under each other. That's why we call it the tetrahedron. Uh, it turns out that for this particular model, the tetrahedral vertex is the only possible dynamical quartic vertex because one can also write down so-called pillow vertices, which this terminology is due to Karotza and Tanasa, who were the first to look at our own cube uh, models of this type, not fermionic in general. Uh, but these, these pillar vertices in this model uh, are just Casimirs of the three gauge groups. So if, if you, so one actually, big point emphasized by Witten is that in this model, we can just gauge this global symmetry, uh, if we, uh, which seems to be really necessary to do if we want a holographic interpretation of this model. If we gauge it, we have to impose that the states are annihilated by these three charges. Then these, these interactions become zero, basically, in the gauged model. So, so the only dynamical interaction is really this, this interaction, the unique dynamical quartic interaction. In these more complicated models like the Gorau Witten model, it's not the case. You also have to, in principle, keep the pillow models. Okay, so, so let's just do a quick comparison between the O and cube and uh, the SYK model. Actually, both of them, as I mentioned, uh, they both belong to this uh, vast field of quartic fermionic Hamiltonians. Right? So both of them can be written uh, in this form, in particular the quartic Majorana Hamiltonians. You have H, which is J, with some indices side, 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 side. Right? So in the case of the SYK model, you just make this index range over some large number of values and make this random. In the tensor model, you can write it in this form and there is no randomness at all. In fact, the couplings only take values zero plus or minus one in units of G, if you set G equal one. And they're just given by products of delta functions. Uh, so that's one way to think about this. So the products actually represents all contraction, color contraction. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they're just contractions. And, and the 24 terms are just the 24 different orderings of... Uh, yeah, we uh, actually did for ONQ minus one, which she does. Right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, right, the, the, uh, yeah, this, this can be generalized to ONQ minus one, where Q is even for, for this particular case. So, so the sex... Yeah, the, the sextic and higher models, they have eventually more possibilities come in of these melonic terms, and then the whole science gets uh, more complicated if you, if you work on tensor models. 
uh, because there are some, uh, let's see, some references include the work by Frank Ferrari and collaborators on the uh, Riva. So where th there is this uh, possible restriction to something called MST, maximally single trace vertices. Anyways, it's, it takes a little bit more thinking to yeah. correspondence between uh, higher Q models and uh, and we wrote a paper with uh, Fedor Popova and Preeti Palagar on uh, on this uh, Q equals six and eight models and so on. Mm -hmm. But the quartic model, then this is just a tetrahedral interaction written in this uh, in this way. The interesting thing is that the number of distinct terms that you get is vastly smaller than what you would get in a general SYK model. They're much more sparse. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you see that N S. If you want to compare the total number of fermions N S Y K, this is really N cube, right? Because each of these I's is really a composite index A B C, or mm -hmm. so N cube of them. Uh, and you see that uh, in turn, so this N is the N of the tensor models and N S Y K equal N cube is the N of the corresponding S Y K model. Then you can just count how many distinct non-zero terms there are. And in the tensor model, it grows like N to the six, while in the S Y K model, it grows like N to the 12th, of course. This is just the total number of uh, the binomial coefficients here. Right, so uh, so you see that it's more sparse, and then we we actually then you can make further restriction on O n cube uh, S O n cube singlet states, but the whole business is somewhat uh, more complicated, and it's we, we wrote a paper on S O four cube model where we we saw some systematics of these singlet states, but um, but it's generally harder. Uh, so, so since I'm on the subject of singlet states, here is uh, the possibility that you can do. You can gauge this tensor model to eliminate large degeneracies and focus on states invariant under SON cube. Their number can be counted. This was done in one of our papers here. Uh, and you get extremely rapid transition. Uh, so for n equal two, you have only two singlets. For n equal four, you have 36. For n equal six, you get 595 million. So, so for this n equal four, where there are 36 singlet states, we succeeded in determining their complete energy levels. But needless to say, it's not possible to do exactly this case. Uh, so this, this model is in principle very interesting theoretically, but it's harder to study numerically. The reason there is such a rapid transition is because, uh, because there is really two to the n cube over two minus some subleading terms, number of singlet states. And this two to the n cube over two is a huge number already for n equals six. On the other hand, uh, the diagrammatics of the model is really identical to that of the uh, of the SYK model. So we expect essentially the uh, we expect a very similar um, uh, large n limit. Uh, so let's just do do things diagrammatically. So suppose we want to study two point function in this SYK model. We have to resum diagrams using the Dyson Schwinger equation for large n. Uh, and the bare propagator just in the non interacting, this is the UV propagator, non interacting quantum mechanics is just sine, right? It jumps from minus one half to plus one half. And then this is the Dyson Schwinger equation, which gives you the exact propagator in terms of the bare propagator and the now, if you uh, solve this equation numerically for the exact green function, one thing that you have to have is that at zero, it must be exactly one half because chi squared is equal to one half. Uh, 
and this is the UV cutoff kind of you you basically there is no cannot be any divergence in this theory because uh, there's findings of the degree of freedom. Uh, but uh, if you solve this equation, <coughs> there is this conformal approximation, uh, which is shown in uh, in light blue line here, which is uh, very close to the exact propagator. And, and then you get this exact scaling dimension delta equal to one quarter for the fermion. So, so this is a solvability of this, uh, uh, this uh, model. And, and the tensor model has exactly the same uh, equation in the infrared. So, so you find basically exactly the same structure. And again, the, you get H equal to or dimension equal to one quarter. Now, a more complicated calculation, which was first done by Kitaev, was uh, to look at four-point function. And this is obtained by iteration of the kernel. Uh, and this gives, gives us, uh, basically, since this is four fermions, when you bring them together, uh, you get fermion bilinear operators. Uh, so there is by now the standard technology for studying the spectrum of these two particle uh, operators. And, uh, uh, and at the end, you get that a certain function of dimension H has to be set equal to one. Now, when you plot it, uh, you see that the first dimension is H equal two, and this is the exact dimension, and then there is some series, a kind of like a regi trajectory of dimensions, uh, which, uh, which uh, have a nice simple asymptotic limit. Now, when people talk about this Jakeev Teitelboim dual, they essentially are talking only about this mode. And then these modes are not as well understood. They sort of have to be coupled by hand and so on. So this is the model that really incorporates the effects of the on gravity, but the whole theory is much more complicated. And in the tensor model, there are lots of additional operators which are even less understood. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the basic structure for, uh, for this uh, single SYK or single ON cube tensor model. Uh, yeah, just to repeat that uh, it's a bit of a miracle. I mean, the two models are uh, microscopically very different, as I, as I showed. Yeah, uh, just two very different models. One uh, at finite end, the spectra look totally distinct, but somehow in the large end limit, due to this miracle of melonic diagrammatics, they really become uh, become the same. But now we want to. So this is basically the review, and now I want to switch gears to uh, slightly complicating these nearly conformal models, uh, namely coupling a pair of them to each other in a particular way, and just seeing what happens if we can get more dynamical phenomena. And actually, we will be able to find very interesting phenomena some pairing phenomena, which condensed matter physicists are always interested in. But before I get to that, maybe I'll pause to see if there are questions. <clears throat> okay, so. Any questions? People don't know. <laughs> yeah, we may proceed. Okay, so, so let me talk about this uh, two-flavor ON cube model and the related, we call them, uh, so this is a tensor counterpart of two coupled Majorana SYK models. Now, some of you may have heard of a very nice paper by Juan Maldacena and Saolan Chi, uh, who studied this uh, two coupled Majorana SYK models of, uh, a wormhole, not a black hole, but for a wormhole. Mm -hmm. uh, their model is a little different because they just introduced a coupling, 
chi one, chi two, just a quadratic coupling between these two models, which acts like as a mass term and gaps it out. We will be introducing a quartic coupling, uh, as I will uh, show in a second. And then the operator is nominally marginal, but it, uh, something a bit more dynamical can happen. So, <laughs> so let's just take a two flavor O and cube model, two rank three Majorana tensors, Psi one and Psi two, and couple them in a way that preserves the O and cube symmetry. Uh, and also here we added three possible terms to also preserve a certain discrete symmetry. Uh, <coughs> this discrete symmetry is essentially that every time we interchange two ON groups, we get a minus sign. H goes to minus H. Uh, we were guided by, there is something called the bipartite, complex bipartite model. Uh, uh, and we initially started uh, studying that. If you set alpha equal to minus one, you get a model which can be simply written in terms of complex fermions, psi one plus i psi two. Then it just looks like psi, uh, psi one plus i psi two to the fourth plus psi one minus i psi two to the fourth. Uh, but this is a more general model and we'll see some very amusing behavior as a function of alpha actually we'll see that different ranges of alpha have different physics. But this alpha corresponds to what? This is the just interaction strength? Yeah, it's just a quartic coupling. Oh, okay. Uh, it's quartic coupling, coupling uh, psi, two psi ones with two psi twos. Okay. It's dimensionless because we already have a G sitting outside. Mm -hmm. G can be set to one, it's just a unit of energy. So it has only one real uh, coupling constant. And we'll actually see that there is a huge sensitivity to the sign of alpha. For a slightly positive alpha, the theory remains nearly conformal. For slightly negative alpha, there is symmetry breaking. It's sort of an unexpected thing, but uh, at least not completely expected, but we spent uh, many months checking it in various ways. And, uh, so here, here is my report on that. So if you just formally study these uh, Dyson-Schwinger, Schwinger-Dyson equations, we get this two-point function. Okay, you just rescale the same one you had before by some factor of alpha. So it seems like a fairly boring conclusion, like not much has happened here. There is still, uh, these psi's have dimension h equal to one quarter. Uh, but this model has some additional symm discrete symmetry. For example, there is some uh, discrete particle hole symmetry. Then there is, a, for if you think of uh, psi one plus psi psi two as complex fermion, you can rewrite the model in a way that, where you can see that the fermion number is only conserved mod four. Because there are these terms like what I described, psi to the four and psi bar. So there is no U1 symmetry, there is only Z4 symmetry here, corresponding to the skew. And one big outcome of our studies is that this Q operator actually, for negative alpha, acquires a, a vacuum expectation value in the large envelope. Uh, so, so how do we see that? How do we see that this is possible? Well, let's just play the same game we already played for a single SYK model and just study the scaling dimensions of uh, fermion by linear operators. So there are four types of them here. And the particular type we'll be interested in is this fourth one, psi one, psi two. So when n is zero, it's just this psi one, psi two operator. Then you have to derive this kernel and uh, Values of this kernel. This is a well set machinery by now, checked in hundreds of papers. So you get uh, various functions of alpha multiplying these same GA stands for anti symmetric sector and GS stands for symmetric sector, some functions of H. And then you're supposed to set these quantities equal to one, and this tells you the scaling dimension. Uh, 
And basically what you see is that for the fourth one, uh, the, the first scaling dimension formally goes complex when alpha becomes negative. You basically see that the real solution disappears and this operator Q acquires complex dimension. Its imaginary part turns on only for negative alpha. It turns on as a square root. And this essentially is showing us that there is something wrong with the business as usual kind of. We can't assume business as usual for negative alpha. We can't assume nearly conformal solution because then the theory tells us, oh, there is something wrong here because the, there is no real solution for this operator. And what we'll see that what goes wrong is that this operator actually acquires a, an expectation value. Uh, one interesting detail is that this particular two flavor model has an interesting duality symmetry, which uh, obtained by after a definition of fields, like if you redefine fields into psi tilde fields, you get the same model with a modified alpha. And this allows us to restrict everything to the range of alpha from minus one to one third. So it turns out that the fixed line where the theory is nearly conformal is between zero and one third. And the symmetry broken phase is when alpha is between minus one and zero. <clears throat> and so now this, this is starting to sound like something that's been in the news lately called complex CFTs. It actually has a long history. Uh, various examples show that uh, when it's a gen generic phenomenon, when two real fixed points merge, they can go off into a complex plane. And then after that, you find that uh, scaling dimensions are no longer real. And this has been uh, dubbed uh, complex CFTs by Garben, Karichkov, and Zahn. Uh, uh, they actually correspond not to second order transitions, but to sometimes to weekly first order transitions. And uh, in another work that I've done recently, you can sometimes get models where these imaginary parts uh, appear non-perturbatively and so on. But the bottom line is that if, uh, strictly speaking, once uh, scaling dimension goes complex and is of the form d over two plus i alpha, you can basically say that the dual, that the CFT is unstable. For example, in the dual anti-de-sitter space, the scalar dual to this operator would be violating the brighton lohner friedman stability bound. And we all know, we all cherish the stability bound. So, so this is roughly what's going on, that it's no longer a fully healthy, uh, stable CFT. Uh, so one has to look for some other phenomenon uh, in this negative alpha range between minus one and zero. And, uh, and uh, let, let's just uh, explain what happens. And to explain what happens, let me first exhibit uh, this uh, double, uh, double SYK model, which turns out to be at large and equivalent to this double tensor. So we take uh, a single set of anti-symmetric couplings, J, I, J, K, L. Uh, if alpha is zero, these two models are basically decoupled, just correlated by J. And then alpha appears here. And this model has exactly the same large N Schwinger Dyson equations as this tensor model. Uh, so this tensor model is somehow large N double SYK model. The advantage of double SYK model is one, one can do some numerical <laughs> exact diagonalizations and also see some uh, check the phenomena that you're finding via large N along with the symmetry. Okay, so, <laughs> so here, uh, here is basically the structure. So for alpha between zero and one third, there is this fixed line, no 
how imaginary parts of the scale of the dimensions. And we find that the low temperature entropy also does not apply. It's the same C naught that I already illustrated this. It's the same as for two, two decoupled oscillation models. <laughs> Um, okay, so now uh, for this fixed line, if we study the two point functions, uh, it's a very similar calculation. And in particular, you, the, the two point function mixing the two is just forbidden by the symmetric symmetry chi one and minus chi one. So if you assume this diagonal solution, G11 equals G, G22 equals G of T, and solve everything, then you, you basically get uh, exactly the same uh, story that you saw in the single SYK model up to a certain rescaling. But now uh, let's go to negative alpha and actually assume that this G uh, of diagonal uh, two-point function is non -mass. So you, you just write down a more uh, complete set of possible two-point functions, which are G, A, B, with this. Uh, uh, and they have the following symmetry. So G, the diagonal ones are anti-symmetric functions of tau. And G12 turns out to be ima pure imaginary. It's an even function of tau. Yeah, so it's G12 equal to minus G21, but then at the end it will become an even function of tau. Yeah, we, we're imposing a certain discrete symmetry here. Okay, so, so after the, these symmetry assumptions, uh, you get a simple effective action and you you solve it and you, uh, you see a phase transition as a function of temperature. For example, for alpha equal minus one, at low temperature, you see that this uh, G12 appears and it's, it actually falls off exponentially. So unlike the power law fall off that we saw in the fixed line phase here, they decay exponentially. While at high temperature, G12 goes back to zero and you restore this uh, symmetry that forbids, uh, forbids G12. So that's the main uh, result from the point of view of Dyson-Schwinger equations, that, uh, that you, in the negative alpha phase, you see the symmetry breaking via developing of G12. Uh, <clears throat> so now, so this, you may say, how do you know that these are the right, this is the right this is where it's very important to do these exact diagonalizations. Namely, just throw the system on the computer, do random sampling of uh, J's and plot the spectrum. And one thing that we actually, you don't need to try to get, but it's almost like stares at you. For example, you take N equals 16, which is a pretty high number, 16 qubits. Uh, <laughs> You, you see this gap between the two lower states and other states. Uh, and these, this is a classic situation where you see a Z2 symmetry breaking, tendency towards Z2 symmetry break. There are two nearby ground, uh, nearly degenerate ground states and uh, separated from the rest. It's completely unmistakable. You do sampling after sampling, you always see this. And this is actually what happens in transverse field uh, easing model, for example. So, uh, so it's uh, the symmetry breaking and the gap kind of stare at you in these exact diagonalizations. Uh, and uh, you get uh, two uh, states with tiny splittings. Uh, and uh, a very impressive correspondence between this Dyson Schwinger calculation diagonalization is to, for different values of alpha, is to do fit of ground state energy versus N, determine the slope, and then basically see 
whether E naught over Jn agrees with Schwinger Dyson, and the agreement is very accurate. So, so basically, exact diagonalization supplied with large n extrapolation uh, are very accurately in agreement with this Dyson Schwinger solution, <laughs> including this uh, G1. This is the low temperature case. So this gives us a big confidence that we are not just making some ad hoc concepts. We are really descri describing the true phase of this. Um, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Yes. So a non zero alpha already breaks a symmetry in the UV Hamiltonian, doesn't it? Uh, no. Uh, no. No, we adjusted this quartic term so that uh, it does it does not again it preserves all the symmetry. It preserves, for example, let me just go back. Uh, yeah, here is the Hamiltonian. So one symmetry is just chi one to minus chi one, or chi two to minus chi two. This symmetry is preserved by this quartic term, and that's the symmetry that we're breaking. In Maldasana Chi, they just added mu chi one chi two. Then this uh, interaction term did break the symmetry. Mm -hmm. But we, we really break the symmetry. The model somehow knows to break it spontaneously and only for one sign of alpha. For positive alpha, it doesn't happen. It only happens for negative. Okay. okay, so. Uh, so these two lowest states with tiny splitting, which uh, we believe actually is uh, going to zero exponentially in N, is a classic situation of seeing the breaking of Z2 symmetry. Uh, or if you do the similar thing for positive alpha, you see no gap at all in, in these finite phase. Uh, for example, for alpha equal one third, which is another amusing model for various reasons, it actually has enhanced U1 symmetry. You see that near the edge, there is absolutely no, uh, no gap, and it actually turns on like E squared, uh, the density of states. So all seems to be solid for this model. Uh, and one of the interests is this uh, connection with wormhole. Basically, once you have a gapped phase, this is like two black holes that uh, got connected the wormhole phase of the theory is supposed to have a uh, very low entropy, unlike the black hole. This manifests and manifests itself in uh, this gap appearing. Now, for Maldasena Chi, where the symmetry was broken explicitly, there is no mistake, there is a gap. But this gap happens for both signs of mu. So their model had this mu, chi 1, chi 2 term, and for either sign of mu, you, you get the gap. And our model only for this negative alpha, you get the gap. And if you go back to this uh, gauge upper wall model, which sort of initially introduced this, they actually wanted to have a model where only for one sign of the coupling do you get uh, do you get this wormhole formation because you have to lower the energy somehow rather than raise it. And I think our model is some, made perhaps somewhat closer to this. Gauge-Jefferies wall model of wormhole with this dynamical breaking of the symmetry. Okay, so so this finishes this work on a two coupled Majorana SYK model, and now I will talk about uh, this. In case you read the mailings last night, you may have noticed our paper uh, with uh, Milohan Tonopolsky and Zhao. Uh, and then the day, the previous mailing, to our great surprise, uh, uh, the same model basically was published by Marcel Fox and collaborators from UBC. Uh, so, and this is actually something that we tried to do for many months, and then we we're checking it in various ways is to find a simple model where instead of Z2 symmetry, a U1 symmetry gets broken. And uh, it's not totally obvious what to try, but then we converged after a while on this model, which is, so if you just take a simple 
term like this with complex J's, this is called complex SYK model. So now there are N of these uh, complex fermionic oscillators with this anti-commutation relation. And we take two species of them with this extra alpha coupling. So and here in the coupling J, uh, the comma is used uh, to differentiate between the, uh, like... Yeah, yeah, the, the first pair of indices is anti-symmetric yeah. and the second pair is anti-symmetric. Yeah, yeah. There is also additional hermeticity relation, which... Yeah. ...do this. Yeah, that J-I-J comma K-L is equal to J star K-L comma I-J. True. Yeah, that's, uh, you don't have to put it, you can just keep it in mind that... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is definitely no simple symmetry interchanging J and K, for example. There is only I and J anti-symmetry and K and L. This is a minimal set of symmetries for Js. Actually, there is a longer story behind this that we've been playing with uh, also, but, uh, but this is the standard definition of complex SYK. And uh, this model was actually close to the one that uh, Sajdev and Yeh originally introduced. They didn't have Majoranas, they had these C's and C daggers. And then Subir wrote some papers on it. And uh, last fall, there was a very elaborate paper by uh, Ying Fei Gu, uh, Kitaev, uh, Subir Sajdev, and Tarnapolsky, who studied many features of this model very carefully, and this was also helpful for what we were doing. So we are taking two of these models with, again, alpha, real alpha, and these symmetries ensure hermeticity of this Hamiltonian. And basically, we find something similar, namely for, for positive alpha, the U1 cross U1 is not broken, and we have a fixed line. For negative alpha, it, one of the U1s is broken. So which U1 is broken? Well, you can think of them as two symmetries, a diagonal U1, which rotates this U1 it's, it's the same way, and the axial U1, uh, which rotates them in opposite ways. Right. Uh, and uh, and it's the axial one that's uh, that's actually broken. Uh, so what you get is a pairing phenomenon, and uh, vacuum expectation value of operator C one i dagger C two i actually such that. And this I think is closer to being of interest to condensed matter uh, physicists because uh, you know pair, uh, u1 breaking is like superconductivity. We believe that it's a very solid, simple model where you can really see this in uh, very precise ways. There, there were other constructions uh, recently uh, which can be compared with this. I think this uh, model, because of this availability of the Melonic large end limit, allows us some extra kind of formal tools to check that this is what happens. And again, we, the strategy will be similar. We will use exact large and Dyson Schwinger equations and exact diagonalizations. Uh, and also this, uh, this uh, method of computing scaling dimensions uh, and then continuing them outside the fixed line. So like in previous work, the hint of something going, uh, something interesting happening for negative alpha is that the dimension of exactly this operator C1 dagger C2 becomes formally complex. It's again formal of the form one half plus I times this function. And you see that this function turns on only at negative alpha or at alpha being uh, greater than one. And it reaches maximum at alpha equal to minus one half. That appears to be a rather special point. And this basically again means that the symmetric ansatz where we uh, excluded G12 based on uh, the symmetry is actually inconsistent outside of this fixed line. This is a very, I think, very solid uh, argument for why something interesting has to happen. Uh, and now we uh, 
wrote down Dyson Schwinger equations with certain symmetry assumptions uh, on G11 and G22. Uh, and again, they, in the end, turned out to be very, very similar to this coupled Majorana SYK, namely this G12, the off diagonal green function is pure imaginary and symmetric, and G11 and G22 are real and uh, odd. Uh, but in this model, there is no exact duality symmetry. So you really have to consider the entire range of optimizers. Uh, okay, then you do the exact solutions and you find the, basically the same phenomena that we already saw for negative alpha at low temperature. You see this uh, both G11 and G22, uh, G12 going uh, exponentially falling off, indicating a gap. High temperature symmetry gets restored. And you can see this at difference values of alpha outside of this uh, fixed line. Uh, so the appearance of this off diagonal green function shows that because G12 at zero is exactly the VAV of C1 dagger C2. So it's, and here we're basically plotting it as a function of temperature we're seeing that at low temperature, this really turns out. Uh, and then uh, Green's functions are seen here to decay exponentially corresponding to gap spectrum. Now the gap, uh, the exact diagonalizations, here there is some uh, new twist on that because of the un underlying U1 cross U1 symmetry, you can do them separately in all these different charge sets. And again, so you see these interesting shapes for the histograms. But you, in sectors with Q plus being zero, you see again this unmistakable gap, seeing that something dynamical happens. This is uh, the kind of numerical work that I think can be pushed further, but uh, even uh, with modern day computers, you can go to somewhat higher end. But luckily, already for n equal 10, uh, you, you basically see the, a lot of the phenomena that, uh, that you, these Dyson Schwinger equations are. Indicate just as a check that you have the right ansatz, we again took the ground state energy as a function uh, of n from exact diagonalization, computed the slope, and computed it with the Dyson Schwinger result and the symmetry broken case, and we see good agreement. This, uh, to make it fly, one needs to average over hundreds of samples. Uh, so it really was hard work, uh, which alas, I didn't do. <laughs> but, yeah, I had uh, good collaborators. Uh, so, so the so you after this uh, repeated sampling of the random models, you get these curves, and uh, so it all seems uh, seems good. So this model really does uh, does break the one symmetry, and you can ask where is the number Goldstone mode for negative alpha? Well, it manifests itself in the near degeneracy of of the sectors with different Q minus. You basically, you can compute something called compressibility. Namely, if you plot the ground state in Q minus sector for Q plus equals zero, Q minus is the broken charge. You basically see these nice parabola uh, in the symmetry broken phase. Uh, the fit to parabola is very, very good, the low Q. And the coefficient can be fit, the coefficient B minus can be fit to function of n, and this determines compressibility. So you basically see that uh, at large n, there is this q, q minus squared over n, which gives small splittings, and the large n limit, all of these uh, different q minus sectors will become degenerate. So that's basically how you see the approach to u1 symmetry breaking from these finite n diagonalizations. And then final point, which is actually was one of our original motivations is that the model 
there is a special point, which is alpha equal to one quarter, where u1 minus symmetry gets enhanced to su2. And this model actually was uh, explored as a kind of uh, interaction model for quantum dots. And here the su2 can model the physical spin symmetry and u1 is actually the physical charge. So it's a very uh, nice model, nice example of our model. Uh, this particular model does not appear to exhibit U1 symmetry breaking because it sits somewhere in the middle of the fixed line. But, uh, but it, it's uh, sort of an interesting melonic model for, uh, for something more physical, I think, where you actually have the, the spin degree of freedom and so on. When you make alpha different from this, you're basically violating the full rotational symmetry for the spin from this point of view. Okay, so, so this is uh, basically what I have to say. So let me conclude. Uh, so the, just going back to the beginning, we uh, have this ON cube for meonic tensor quantum mechanics, which seems to be the closest non-random counterpart of the basic Majorana SYK model. And solution of Dyson Schwinger equations indicates a nearly conformal phase with real scaling dimensions. And this to some extent has been checked using exact diagonalizations for the random model. Uh, now, cup, uh, if you couple two Majorana SYK models, you get these formally complex scaling dimensions, which really indicate an instability of the conformal phase. And we studied such a model for two rank three Majorana tensors for two Majorana SYKs. We found a fixed line for positive coupling, uh, but we find a gap for negative coupling. So it sounds like there is some, for negative alpha, there seems to be some kind of attractive interaction which gives pairing between the chi one and chi two, between the different flavors. And then the gap opens up and this looks uh, similar to the, in spirit at least, to the gauge of first wall wormhole construction. And now the most uh, recent work, which has just appeared, is uh, two coupled complex SYK models. Each of them has U1 symmetry. The coupled model we took so that there is U1 cross U1. And then for negative alpha, we see that this axial U1 is broken by a similar pairing mechanism, uh, pairing C1 dagger with C2. I think it's, uh, it's a somewhat new effect in these exactly solvable melonic models. So one can hope that there is some physical application to this. Uh, so, but uh, at least uh, I'm fairly excited about this, uh, this nice little model for you on breaking. Thank you. So we have to thank uh, by clapping uh, for uh, giving such a nice talk and it's a really a, a big picture you have given so thank you, thank you. and uh, you guys can ask the short question because he have to go for some thesis defense so yeah, yeah I have a few minutes still about 11 yeah. that probably so you can, can I ask you a question sorry, sorry. Uh, so, 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 why is, do you have any intuition why U1 minus was broken and not U1 plus? Uh, yeah, I, I can try to, to give a couple of, uh, yeah, um, let's see. It has to do, uh, this is something I, I didn't have time to stress, but uh, if you look at this model, the J's are uh, complex. If you derive the Schwinger Dyson equation, uh, there, there is really, it, you cannot basically put in the green functions of the form C1, C2. The com the complex, averaging over complex J eliminates them from the problem. So it's just, it's just how you sample J's. For example, if you made J's real, then it's no longer the case. So, so if this three term had three different J's, 
then that the business could be different. No? Yeah, for us, it's important that J's are the same and not, not separately chosen. I think the effect that we're talking about would disappear if we took different J's uh, here and here. Why is that? Do, 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 I mean, because I would say it's... Because when we do, for example, there are terms, like when you derive these Dyson-Schwinger equations, there would be terms like J1, J2, and their average would just be zero. So some terms in our Schwinger Dyson equations would just disappear. Yet people certainly looked at models, at chain models where these J's uh, were all different. Yes. In those models, what I'm talking about did not, uh, did not show up. They didn't have any symmetry breaking and so on. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the, well, the starting point of correlating the two J's that figured in a lot of these wormhole papers, like for example, in Maldas Energy paper, they certainly took the same J. That kind of gives you a correlation between the two black holes. Uh, but but uh, another another way, um, if you this I didn't have time to say, but there is a tensor counterpart for this model. And in that model, there is an SUN cross ON cross SUN symmetry. So one can write a tensor model. In that model, the C1, C2 operator is just not gauge invariant. So I just cannot have this type of C1, C2 pairing. Hmm. But I can have a C1 dagger C2 pairing in that model too. So everything points that in this model, there cannot possibly be this U1 plus break. U1 plus is almost like a kind of, um, it's something you can gauge. And, uh, but U1 minus turns out to be very dynamical and interesting. Hmm. And we tried various variants uh, and uh, I'm not sure, you know, I think it still would be very interesting to find a model, similar model where the actual charge Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, may I ask a question? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, this is a holographic question in, in a sense. Um, as far as I understand, uh, there are conformal operators uh, that can be constructed from a complex oscillator uh, uh, that you described. Uh, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. my question is, uh, is it possible to um, associate with uh, this operator a certain theory uh, described, uh, described by Schwarzschild, for example, or something else? Mm -hmm. Well, Schwarzschild usually describes these lowest operators, right? Like the Hamiltonian itself. Uh, and the U1 charges. Like if you just take this uh, dual relation between Jekyll, Teitel, Bohm, Dilett on gravity and single SYK model, all these higher operators you at first throw away. You have to add them in by hand. So we basically, that's why we don't understand the full holography for the SYK model so well. Okay, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so, so it would be go good to understand the more complete structure. But it's, uh, so usually people take JT gravity and add some massive, massive modes. Uh, I've seen that done. But, uh, but it's not like from a top, it's a bit of phenomenological construction. Okay. Any more questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thank you, thank you. And, uh, 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 we, we, we are very uh, hopeful that we can see you again in our forum some other time. And thanks for your time and giving such a elaborative talk. And uh, we, uh, I will post it in uh, YouTube and I will sh uh, share the link with you soon. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much. Stay yeah. safe and healthy. I didn't see the count, so how many people were in the talk? Uh, 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 when you are giving the talk at that time, it, it was like 41, 42. 
right uh-huh. now people are going because it's mm-hmm. very big it's yes, yes. stuff. that's why people left but yeah i saw it is mm-hmm. 42 at that time okay okay sounds good thank you yeah. mm-hmm. bye 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 okay yeah.